Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our third annual Critical Access Hospital or Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. Looks like we have lots of participants flooding in, so I'm just going to give them just a moment to get into the room and we will get started. All right, well, we have a busy packed agenda today, so we're going to kick it off again. Welcome to day two. Um, a few housekeeping items as we get started for today. So everybody should be on mute. Uh, that's automatically taken care of for you. If you would like to ask a question or make comments, please use our chat feature that we have. There's also there's a Q&A and a chat feature that you should have at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Right. All slides and recordings are going to be made available to everybody, uh, everybody who registered following the webinar. We will send it all out, including answers to any questions that are asked that if we don't get to them, the sessions are being recorded. So when the slides are sent out, the recordings will be sent with them. And please, this is very helpful to us. We've been we're doing this now for three years and are very excited about um, the feedback that we've gotten each year and have been making it better and better. So a short survey will follow after the conference session. And so that feedback is very important to us. We really appreciate your time making sure that we're giving you guys the best information possible. So a little bit about Stroudwater for those of you who might be new to working with us or joining us for the first time. Stroudwater, we have been around for, since 1985. We've been around for 38 years working primarily in rural organizations, community hospitals and health systems that have a large impact on rural. This map shows the clients that we've worked with just since 2017. So we don't have our full map of 38 years of history, but as you can see, we have done worked with rural hospitals in all 50 states, including Hawaii and Alaska. Those are always fun, long plane trips to go to those, um, those areas. So we're excited to be with you. We also are featuring um, our newest venture that we started in 2020, Stroudwater Capital Partners, which focuses on helping um, hospitals and health systems and also physician practices find access to capital for their capital projects. We launched that in 2020. And as you can see on the map, they have been very busy from finding money and helping people with their capital projects across the country and have already done, I believe, 17 projects um, for hospitals so far, which is really important during this particular time where people are having issues with access to capital and interest rates. So new uh, new venture that we want to make sure everybody who uh, has capital needs can also access them as well. With that, um, I would also like to point out, like Stroudwater, we are a full service advisory firm, strategic operations, finance, any of your needs. We, as we said, we focus on the rural communities, right? We don't have as much access to the resources that some of the big boys have and making sure that we can help you with there's very specific needs in rural that giving you the technical advice that you need for what are your specific regulations. You guys have been our focus. And so we're proud to be um, one of the preeminent firms across the country to focus on rural. Our strategic advisory services, everything from your long-term planning to your short-term needs are operational. It's everything, your hospitals, your providers, your clinics, the quality that you provide, revenue cycle. We do try to be a completely full service shop where it's very expert based in our, um, most of our employees have been previously in your shoes and have worked in hospitals, health systems and physician groups over the course of their career and now bringing that experience and expertise to you. So with that, let's talk about what we are going to get into today. I'm gonna to hand it over to my colleague, Amy, to introduce to this morning's first topic. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back if you were here for day one and welcome to this webinar if you are just starting today. Thanks, Opal, for that kickoff and just helping us understand better about um, Stroudwater and all of the services that we provide. And I just want to welcome to the table to this presentation. We're going to be talking about some findings from the field. Um, we had a clinic manager in revenue cycle training services that we did um, supporting some, some uh, organizations out there. And we work specifically with the West Virginia Hospital Association. And we have our uh, friend with us, Tamara Tolliver, and it's myself and Opal. We're going to be talking to you today about that. So just giving you some background on this project, we really were out there trying to identify the need. There was a need that happened in West Virginia. And Tamara, can you tell us that you were working toward the end of your contract year, weren't you, with uh, state funds and realized that you had some XX funds out there? And sure. 
Correct. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yes, that's exactly what happened. That we had these excess funds and we were starting to talk about the role and you were relatively new to the position. Can you tell us a little bit about you, um, your background coming to the role and what you wanted to do with this position and this opportunity since we had these state funds that were excess out there? Well, I came from um, the world of working in a hospital with 21 um, employed providers that I was actually trying to help take care of. Um, and so I knew coming from the clinic background that it would be very important to get some clinical knowledge uh, for our rural health clinics um, the best that we could. So we kind of pointed in that direction to, to get try to kick the kickstart the the rural health clinics, um, we always give attention to the critical access hospitals, but not so much the clinic side. So that's how we came up to this point of um, getting some training into those gals and, and, and guys in, in the clinics. Mm -hmm. And it re they were really, you know, so if we think about this, when this all happened, um, it was just last year. So he, you had come off the pandemic and um, we're looking at some challenges with staffing because um, you had walked out of the you really weren't walking out of the pandemic, but, you know, dealing with all of the new changes that were coming across because of COVID and things like that. Can you tell us, was training really something that you had focused on during that previous two-year period at your clinic when you were working there? Not necessarily. Uh, we did keep our offices open, our clinics open, um, but, um, you know, we were up against challenges of doing virtual visits and, you know, I, I mean, we were, we were literally um, hinging on, you know, what's our next steps kind of thing. Um, so training was not anywhere in the picture at all. Mm -hmm. You were... So, you yeah, I'm sorry. You were telling me a story about how, you know, you were trying to deal with just new things that were coming across because in West Virginia, you would have patients that would come to the clinic and tell me a little bit more about how, you know, you would deal with those virtual visits that were happening in your parking lot. <laughs> well, you know, you're living in a in a, a very rural area, you know, and it's it's definitely hard to get those patients into the office, much less them have the capability of doing um, virtual visits. Um, you know, and having uh, the the um, day bandwidth, you know, to be able to do that. So we would actually ask them to drive into the clinics, and we would carry an iPad out to the car to them if they if they didn't have an iPhone or have the ability to be able to do that. So we would carry an iPad to the car, um, you know, masked up, and hand them the iPad, and they would do the virtual visit, and then we would go back to the car, get the iPad, and come back in the clinic. So we were tr trying to find, you know, any way that we could um, to get those patients into the um, into the practices because we knew that they were sick and they did need attention. So uh, we would do a little bit of di different things to try to make that happen for them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the reason I bring that up and was asking you that question is because when you were working in that clinic, your focus was more on just how do we meet the need that is happening today, you know, and the need that was happening at that time was you were just you know, trying to adjust to how you were going to have a virtual visit when it used to be all in person and things like that. And so uh, I know that we were having conversations afterwards, you know, when once that all settled down and things were getting in place, and then we started talking about, you know, you were having some challenges just with staffing and, and other, you knew of other hospitals, this is after you transitioned to your new role, that we had other hospitals that, you know, were dealing with staffing issues and shortages and, you know, turnover had happened in a lot of those positions. And I, you know, really appreciate the fact that you came to us and you were like, you know, I don't really just want to choose it off of the menu of what we're going to do. You know, how can we meet that need of the facilities, you know, these other clinics that are out there in the different hospitals and be able to train them and provide it. And so, you know, just looking at some of these items that we were focusing on, you know, there were some needs out there, just being able to, how can we train all of them, but understanding as well that they couldn't, um, 
they couldn't come to the training. You know, they needed to do something virtually. So Opal, I know that Tamara came to you and presented this idea to you um, about doing the training. What was one of the things that you were thinking about related to this training and the offering that we could provide? Yeah, when, when we were having the conversation with you, Tamara, I remember specifically thinking, oh my goodness, well, not only have we had turnover, but our solution to so much of this turnover had been, well, who's been here the longest? Who can we get in? And just that's the new person in charge of the clinic. And it wasn't just in the clinics. It was also on the revenue cycle team as well. And all the different art departments that so you think about it in a healthcare organization, in the hospital, in rehab, you know, in PT, in the clinics. And so many of these people were at, being asked to be leaders, actually, for the first time in their career, you know, and, and that person might be, hey, I'm the medical assistant who has been here for five years, right? I might be the only person who was here pre-pandemic and remember what things were like before. And recognizing that turnover that we had had, you know, that these people needed not training, not just in you know, how to do their jobs, they probably knew how to do their jobs, they needed really leadership training of now, how do you change your mind, your mentality, you're no longer just the person checking in patients, you're not the person who's just doing the billing and coding, you might be leading a team for the first time in your career. And the person who you weren't necessarily being trained by the person who held your position before that person might be gone. And so having somebody who can guide you through leadership development to build that organizational capacity in a way that was going to be effective of like, okay, here's how you have to think differently now that you're leading a team, that those are probably your friends. Those are the people that you were standing side by side with throughout this entire pandemic. And you now as a leader, as a manager, that's a different role, right? To be, you know, how are you going to deal with the HR issues of, you know, now, now I'm inspecting your work. Now I'm trying to encourage you to bring out your best in work and to bring all of your best ideas. Now I'm I'm responsible to administration for providing re reports. You know, I have to explain a budget. <laughs> Those are completely brand new things that so many of these people had never done before. And we were, and I remember Tamara us talking about, okay, this is this is multifaceted. This isn't just, hey, give them a checklist of okay, every single day you're going to come into the clinic and do X, Y, and Z and make sure you, you know, you check, here's the HIPAA compliance binder that we have and, you know, make sure you read it and look for all of these things. And we're like, this is a really multifaceted project as to what people needed that training on. And so like, how should we approach that to get as many people as possible? Because I remember, Tamara, we had the conversation and you might recall the very first time you stepped into that leadership role and having to tell somebody who was your friend, you're not doing your job right. Right. Um, like, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm creating a flashback for you, but that's that probably was, a, you know, a significant change to, hey, this is not just your coworker anymore. This is your subordinate. Right. Um, well, and you have those people in the offices, too, that say to you, um, I, I don't think I can do this. You know, I, <laughs> I, I've been friends with these people for a while. But, you know, sometimes, um, you know, during the pandemic, you may have one or two uh, office staff in your office when you're typically having five, maybe at some points. Um, and, you know, and they're they're having to learn quickly and and there's no time for training when you get in those, you know, those spots. So um, yeah, it, it 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 was very hairy back in the it, it, during the pandemic for sure. Lots lots of different changes were happening very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I remember when we designed the program, we we're like, okay, we want to make sure we can get people something quick, right? And ha right. and having it, we know that nobody's going to send their staff to a day long retreat. Nobody right. has the ability to close things down, do in person. So we knew we needed to do it virtually. We knew we needed it. Let's do this as a multi-part series so that people could be like, all right, I have a lunch break. Let me go and participate. What's the, what time is lunch time for the majority of clinics? You know, is it 12 to 1, 1230 to 130, et cetera, um, for staff to be able to take a break and do this. Let's make sure that there's recordings so that if they do miss it, that, you know, patient comes, patients are running late. Um, something comes up that they can go back and look at it later but also like, how can we have this continuity? So making sure we had recordings, but also handouts, templates, you know, all these different things, the checklist that, you know, you're gonna, you're especially being new to the role, this training might be overwhelming at first. So you need to go back and reference the material, but also have 
the easy takeaways of, okay, here's a script that I got in this training that I'm just going to print off. And tomorrow, that's how we're going to like, we're going to, I'm going to meet with my team. We're going to make a few edits to make it per, um, for us and team. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to check in patients tomorrow. And so that they could digest that, but also have that reference that recognizing the person we just trained, they may turn over as well. Mm -hmm. And so can we create almost this training package for whoever is going to be in this role, especially you might have time to send the person from this rural health clinic, but you might have three more outreach clinics that also need training, but there's no way you have time to send that person um, to get some training. Can you provide them with some material? So I remember specifically when we were collaborating, the three of us to discuss how do we put this together? Those were some really um, specific objectives and recognizing the really big thing of these people and that most of them that are moved into this position now that, that they're now part of administration, uh, they still have a full-time day job. Usually they're like, okay, we're going to give you an additional 50 cents an hour to now wear this leadership hat and be in charge of all the reports. You don't get any more time, right? You still, yeah. you know, and you don't get any new staff to step into the role of, you know, rooming patients. You have to still do your full-time job and figure out how to be this leader while working your, your day job. And, um, you know, but congratulations on your, your <laughs> additional 50 cents in that. Maybe, maybe the organization had enough pandemic, you know, COVID money that it was maybe, it, maybe you got a whole 75 cents or a dollar more mm -hmm. um, to be in this administration role, but it definitely, you still had to do it at the same time. Um, yeah. Amy? Oh, go ahead, Tamara. No, I was, I was going to say the, the whole, the whole process that you guys organized for us very quickly, I might add. Um, was very helpful. And as you said, it, it was wrapped up with a bow on top. And, you know, it was actually left with the, them to be able to go back and revisit. And the, I think the templates were probably the best gift that you could have given um, because we got a lot of positive feedback, um, you know, from, uh, from those who didn't have um, a process in place, if you will, um, to begin with. So, you know, after pandemic, they were really needing some help. So er everything as far as that whole revenue, um, you know, clinical manager process that you gave to us was awesome. It, it worked very well. So Tamara, yeah. do, you, do you see that they would um, incorporate this in their training going forward? You know, to they've got a new employee that comes on and, and is there part of their onboarding process that they're including these recordings and these handouts? Absolutely. Um, you, you know, it was done in a three-part series, if I remember correctly. It's been so long ago since we did it, but um, it, yes, absolutely. The train, you know, it, any all of that information. Um, and as I was telling you guys um, earlier, the processes of um, having um, the scheduling um, piece that you put together for them to go through. Uh, was very also very helpful. I said that's a delicate dance between the doctor and a schedule. And if they're employed by a hospital, you get the CEO because they want to see more numbers on the book. Um, and it, it's a delicate dance to do that. So um, it's uh, great to have that information and, and, and the possibilities and the processes in front of them so that they can make those decisions for themselves. So Amy, I know Tamara and I both have spent our careers working primarily with the physicians. We are both clinic people, you know, tend to be away from the hospital, but talk, Amy, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the mentality that you brought in designing and also picking the topics for revenue cycle, because that was definitely not our area of expertise. I remember us sitting down and we were like, okay, here's, you know, here's, we've been in those shoes. So we know exactly what you know, what I wish I knew as a clinic manager, what Tamara wishes that she knew as a clinic manager, but talk to us a little bit about the revenue cycle mentality, especially coming out of the pandemic of what, you know, what changes were happening um, that you need, that everybody needed to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, Opal, I appreciate you asking the question. And I really appreciated the fact that we could provide some training to the revenue cycle side. Um, you know, my background is in accounting, but if you talk to me nowadays, you hear that I talk 
about the revenue cycle piece because I did that job for so long. And when I was in that role, I was just striving for somebody else who would speak my same language. It's like, oh, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about this challenge related to provider credentialing that's not credentialing at the hospital, but it's credentialing with the payer and this payer is not paying today and that payer is paying, you know, they've given me a new denial. How do I face it? And so when we were able to offer this, what I found so um, exciting about it for me personally was that I got to meet a whole bunch of other people who spoke my same language. You know, it's almost like the difference between Portuguese and Spanish. They are near enough alike that you can communicate with each other, but at the same time, they're very different from one another. And so when it, when we got to meet these people, what was it? What was really cool about it was that it wasn't just hospital people that were coming, but if your hospital was owned by a system, the system was sending their revenue cycle people to participate in it so that they could understand more about the needs of a critical access hospital because the needs are different um, because the reimbursement methodology is different. So when we set this up, set up the training cycles for revenue cycle, um, we started off on the first one just being, what is your strategy? How do you manage revenue cycle? Um, and what do we mean by revenue cycle? What does that encompass? And so if um, when you work through this, it's like here are all of the various activities that we see uh, in some hospitals, they may just call it coding you know, or it may just be billing. Oh, we just give that to billing, but it's more robust than that. And so we got everyone on the same page to say, here's how you do it. And then we leveraged some information on how to track that. What are some key indicators that you should look at every month or every week or even daily to make sure that your processes are working as efficiently as they could versus, um, the financial health of your accounts receivable and financially, what is how is that impacting your facility? So we did that one, but then what we were able to do is we offered front end revenue cycle improvements with best practices. Because while I talk about revenue cycle and I say you all may refer to it as coding or billing, um, there really are different groups of people who handle the different tasks. And so by, by being able to offer a front-end improvement versus a back-end revenue cycle improvement, offering that in two different webinars, we were able to get two different audiences to attend it. And you didn't, they didn't really become bored and be like, oh, this is all about front-end stuff that doesn't relate to me. But they would know if I go to that back-end one, they're going to talk about denials management and how to get my claims out and the challenges we face with editing versus the front end where it's like how to collect the copays and talk to the patient up front and meet and greet them and getting the right charges captured and things like that. And also by doing it virtually, we were able to just allow, have a greater reach. We didn't require people to travel. So Tamara, I know um, that getting people to travel in is really hard and you can't just say, let's send my whole revenue cycle team. But you know, by offering this, we had that solution to be able to say, they can do this remotely. They can come in and, and take that class remotely. Oh, this first one, look at what we're gonna talk about with the revenue cycle front end piece of it. These are the people that need to be invited versus the people who do the back end side of it. Um, I just- well, and Amy, I think we actually had 20 out of um, West Virginia's 21 critical access hospitals participate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this was flex funded. So to have really that high of a participation, I think really speaks to how well Tamara knows what her hospitals <laughs> need. To, because well, how many know, times did revenues, that happen? Yeah, <laughs> on the revenue cycle piece too, you know, you hire, when you're hiring your girls, the, your in, employees to work that front desk, they think they're just there to answer the phone and schedule an appointment. They don't understand the importance of all the other pieces that go together with, um, you know, the collection side and, um, you know, telling them about their bill if they owe something or, you know, so, and you guys got into that. You, you made sure that they understood that piece of, of the puzzle as well, which was very helpful for them. 
And, and a lot of times in those revenue cycle position roles, there's somebody just wanting a job to get into, you know, if I could just get in at this role in six months, I can transfer to another role and, and be, and do something different. And it seems to be one of those roles that just, you know, it, it is a revolving door. So helping them understand up front that what you are doing helps the financial health of your organization and giving them that training and, you know, giving them a little bit more under or a greater understanding as to how they are very influential within their organization, I think is very helpful to, mm. you know, getting that stickiness with an employee to want to stay in the position or why they do what they do. Well, and you want them to understand that every position is important. It doesn't matter if you're a nurse or if you're the front mm -hmm. end person. Every everything that everybody does in the office during the day is an important part of of the team that puts it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just having that to you know to be able to do it, and I think in the in your critical access hospitals and spread throughout you know your state that they don't always get a chance to talk to one another or, you know, they may be owned by a system and why am I doing this? I'm just going to hand it off to such and such or why does, the, why does the home office always call me and ask me for this? I don't understand, but helping to connect those dots to say, this is why you do your role and um, why they're calling you and asking for it rather than making a decision themselves because they don't have that that information, you know, it that's more of a hospital controlled mm -hmm. element as opposed to a, um, you know, just just decide. And it's like, no, you've got to go back to the chart itself or you've got the patient standing in front of you. That can't always be done at a um, consolidated center. But then, you know, on that back end piece of it, helping them you know, understand the challenges that are happening at your clinics and at your hospitals as well. That's oh, Tamara, I have a question for you. Um, like I said, we had 20 out of the 21 critical access hospitals across the state participate. Um, that's a huge feat. So as as the director of the call network, how did you go about getting engagement and like and saying, hey, this is what we're doing? How did you get people to participate in that and, and work, especially because you were new to the you new in your role? So this was in the early years where they were just or early months of your position of get, having them get to know you, and here you are with. Here's something I would like to offer you. Well, we were lucky in the sense that when I I haven't been in this role for until, until July for a year is is my one year mark, and um, I was lucky um, that through that process we were doing all of our flex visits. You know, so we were in the hospitals, in and out of the hospitals um, over like a six week period. We hit 21 hospitals, so. Um, that was just one of the things that we mentioned, you know, in our travels um, during uh, during that period of time that we were going to come up with this, you know, clinic management piece, um, and we thought it was going to be a very good role for um, the you know, the clinics to be involved in it. Um, so I think because it was new and it was a fresh idea, um, everybody hopped on board because we've always taken care of the um, critical access hospitals and do a lot of education pieces with them. Um, through you, you know, through Stroudwater, um, from uh, swing bed and MBQIP and multi different levels of things that we do, uh, the CEO, CFOs, but we'd never really done anything on the clinic side. So I think that that was a new model for them. And they were always, you know, all very interested in, in taking part of it. And um, so I think that's why I think that's why we had so many that were involved, because it was a new idea. Yeah, and I remember, so working with um, your predecessor, we had done a leadership summit back in 2021, where a lot of the critical access hospitals had sent some of their leadership. We did a track on the cost report, and we did a track for specifically for the rural health clinics. And I remember um, when we were going through that, so many people who were there, because they were, this was an in-person session, and there were not as many people who were able to attend, like, where, you know, wanting to know when we did that four part track for the rural health clinics, you know, we went into a lot of details about, you know, requirements and regulations for the rural health clinics that a lot of those things that we were going over were also suspended at the time, like we had waivers in place for the pandemic. Hmm. And with all the turnover we were having, 
we had the conversation about on the clinic management side, what are the most important topics that we can have, but also kind of given that there are new people and recognizing that PHE, I mean, I technically when we did these sessions, PHE was still in place, but we knew it was coming to an end. You know, a lot of these people didn't know um, what they needed to do for a rural health clinic of, oh, these waivers are going to go away. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked about what were going to be the most important things, uh, we we spent some time on that first topic of like clinic management expectations for new managers going over even like uh, minimum productivity thresholds for a rural health clinic, something that the front desk people, you know, if you hadn't been in that role before, don't really even think about or know, like, here's here's how many patients we're trying to see. And if we don't see them, our rate's going to get impacted. I know it hasn't for the past couple of years, but going forward, this is something I need to be paying attention to because this PHE is going to end. And so setting that, you know, that clinic management expectations of, okay, so how do you track this for the first time? And when we were going over the scheduling templates, I know, I remember we talked about, you know, a clinic lives and dies by that template. Mm -hmm. But as you said, <laughs> um, Oftentimes there's might be competing interests, physicians wanting to see patients the way that they want to see them. CEOs have numbers that they're trying to hit. The CFO is very cognizant of the minimum productivity thresholds mm -hmm. because they're always using it to calculate their rate. And so going into, okay, what is this scheduling template? And when you have such a large group like that, recognizing that so many of these clinics might offer different services. Some of them have specialists in it. Some of them have behavioral health, some do not. Some of them are next to their hospital and, um, you know, where they can direct patients for imaging. Some do not. Some are doing, most of them, I think we're doing lab, but like taking into consideration so many of those schedules. And we, I think we provided them at least four different templates of like, hey, we're not going to tell you which one works for you specifically. We're mm -hmm. going to teach you how to think through it. Here are the things you need to think through. Here are some templates that we know that work. Some were vo definitely more advanced models that we were going over. But some of them were really basic, but how do you get, you might want to start with a basic template, but think about, you know, really trying to teach these new managers, the critical thinking skills of how should you look at your template? And then I know the last session we did on the data-driven decision-making and those hospital reports was a big one for people. They were, this was their first time having to provide reports to management and also to have to answer to the physicians mm -hmm. about their numbers, because so many of them, the physician is talking, you know, if you hadn't been in this role before, you might've heard the term work RVU before, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and now all of a sudden you're in this role and the physician's coming up to you and being like, here's my work art, you know, and especially if you ended up in your position, right when there's about to be a quarterly true up of work RVUs and the provider's about to get their paycheck from a productivity bonus. Mm -hmm. And they want to ask you, wait a minute, here's my report that somebody at the hospital printed off. You better be like, explain this to me. And you found out what a work RVU was last week. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so going through that of saying, okay, here are your new responsibilities that you probably have never touched before and had never had to make a decision off of, never had to answer for how should you take a look at that? And so um, given your role that your history, Tamara, of like sitting in the in the seat before and having had that job, you know, was there anything that we touched on during these different sessions that you found, you know, most like most helpful um, that you're like, hey, back when I was a clinic manager, this would have been great. Or um, did you learn anything new? You know, are there any examples of things that you remember from the sessions? Because I think you attended almost all of them, both the revenue cycle and the clinic management one, which was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just trying to, you know, I was new, I was trying to learn. Um, and, and you did touch uh, th there. I came from what I consider a for-profit world, you know, where, where numbers do matter and, and they're all a, at month end, everybody is like, how many, how many, you know, patients do we see? How, what was the revenue? What did, you know, how, what did this all look like? Um, rural health is a little bit different. Um, so I, I had, I, I was on top of what you were giving them and was very thankful that you were giving that to them because I think even if the hospitals aren't asking for that information, which they probably are, um, a lot of times we find that they they are not they don't collect data. They're the you know data is is important 
to to a, any any fraction of a practice. Um, you know, you should always know what your patient numbers look like. You should always know, um, you know, what you collected for the day. Um, so there's a lot of other things that goes on besides. Uh, the care that you're providing to the patient, you know, which is the first and foremost, the most important thing. But you you have to understand all of the other entities that happens in that practice on a daily basis. And it's also important for everybody to know what the roles are and what is involved in those roles in the practice. And you guys hit on all of that information as well. Um, so, um, you know, it's it, it, the practice is important. The patients are the most important, but the practice is also important for growth of that group. So, yeah, I remember one of the things that we talked out specifically, especially for, especially any CEOs who are in the audience right now listening about the importance of that transparency of like reveal, making sure that the clinics know the plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we, add, we, I remember doing a poll. I, I think we did a poll during one of the sessions. I said, how many of you know your organization strategy? Because the clinics are kind of like, oh, organizational strategy. We have a strategic goal in the next five years to grow primary care access by 20%. But nobody told the clinics, right. Yeah. And like what, uh, to come up with that. And so many organizations said that they didn't know what it was, but also that transparency of, you know, how do you involve like we, we were trying to empower the practice managers to go to the C-suite and say, here's what I need to do my job successfully. Mm -hmm. So if you are bringing in a new provider, talking to the, like the administration should be, and should be talking to the provider about the expectations of, hey, we're bringing you in and we expect in two years, you're going to be seeing 20 patients a day so that mm -hmm. they're on the same page, but also making sure the practice manager knows that of, okay, we're like, here's the plan how are we going to do this? Because instead of it just falling on the lap of the provider saying, wait, where's, where's my, where's my support staff? Where's, you know, where, how many rooms do I have access to, et cetera? Like, how do I incorporate this into my scheduling template? If the practice manager doesn't know that the goal is 20 patients a day, then um, by, for that provider, then they're not going to set the template up that way. They're not going to plan staffing, like sharing of MAs that way. They're not going to be able to build their systems that they need to. And so I guess my little pro tip for any CEOs who are in the audience today is make sure you have such a great relationship with your practice administrator that you have a very transparent, open, honest relationship to be able to work together. Because if you want those clinics to be successful, that is absolutely uh, mission critical, or you will not, or you'll be answering to the board as to why you didn't hit that strategic growth plan of 20% primary care growth. Well, and back to the 20% number, if the employees working in the practice doesn't know what the baseline was to begin with, they don't know what that 20% looks like. So that's another thing that they definitely need to be shared with because, um, you know, again, back to numbers, if you, if you know what your practice is doing and you can involve that, um, that's, it, that's golden, you know, but, but they can't grow 20% if they don't know what they're growing it from. And I will say too, from a, you know, I know y'all are talking about the clinical side, but from a revenue for revenue cycle, when we were doing the training, one of the things was just more of an education and awareness. You know, mm -hmm. it's that first one to have the CEOs under, you know, the CEOs and the CFOs understand what the strategy is behind revenue cycle so that they know as they are making decisions and bringing on providers and what that looks like, how that impacts the payments that they're going to receive. It's, you know, helping that, getting everybody on the same page and headed in the right, headed in the same direction, mm -hmm. you know, together, really working together to do that. Um, that was a lot of what our, yes, we're giving them best practices and we're telling them, here's how you do these individual roles, but to then also come back and say, but you need to work together at this because if it's, you know, if you hire a new physician and you never let revenue cycle know about it, it's going to be 90 days after they started seeing patients before they're going to realize, oh, we missed a step upstream and another you know, 100 days after that, before you get the first payment for those services. So mm -hmm. working in conjunction with one another to be able to do that. Um, 
really, I, you know, I see that that being a benefit to to just all of the participants in in the webinar itself, right? And what we were able to share. One of the biggest things too with physicians is credentialing. You know, if you don't start that credentialing process early, 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 it takes a while to get those credentials um, squared away for billing purposes. So that's another piece. Right. And, you know, so Tamara, what's the feedback that you are hearing from your from your hospitals and from the clinics now that, you know, some time has passed. So we're six to six to eight months out after doing the training. What are you seeing, um, hearing from the field? I mean, it, is it still sticking with them? Do you yeah, see that? absolutely. A lot of it is. Um, and, um, you know, they, they're, I think they're very grateful that we have decided that we're going to do some rural health clinic, you know, partnerships with them, if that makes sense. Um, I think they feel like they've been out on an island by themselves for a while. And so I think that's the most positive thing that I'm getting back from them is that um, they like to see that they're getting attention right now. So mm -hmm. yes, but it is, it, it, they very strongly agreed that they, you know, they had gotten a lot out of the the results. So. Yeah. So we did do a survey ahead of time, you know, um, as part of this to, you know, just find out, did they learn something new that they would like to implement, you know, and you can, you can see the results there. And then that was, um, you know, we were able to provide that back to you so that then you can report that when looking at the flex funding and, and, and them, and that, um, piece of it to make sure that it's meeting the needs, but that the funds are being used in an appropriate way and, and supporting it. So. Absolutely. Any, any help that we could give them, we're, mm -hmm. we're definitely on board for. Well, and I mean, I know we're talking about this was funded through Flex, but I did notice that we did get our updated ship activities for the 2023, 2024 year. And the fact that I think the importance of showing the other parts of the hospital that are also important, right, the clinics themselves, that we, you know, in the past, we've only had maybe three or four um, hospitals pick, you know, clinic performance improvement and um, activities under SHIP, but we have um, for West Virginia, eight hospitals this now who've said that, hey, we want some more individualized attention um, you, and that's what we're going to put our SHIP funds towards is actually saying, hey, let's get into some more detail. Um, you know, the training was great. Now, can you actually help us with like, help, you know, help our practice manager, like, here's our numbers and sit down with them and come up with how we can do better um, based off of it. So seeing more, um, eight hospitals this year say the clinics are important enough to take a, um, pay attention to that, I think is also a testament to the impact of um, this training series. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Opal, with that, I know that we are getting close to time and that we've um, got um, a, a slight break after hours. I didn't know if we wanted to open it up and see if anyone had any questions out there for us related to this training. Um, if anyone wanted to send those in, we can open it up now. Uh, there is a break after our session, so if we need to go over, we can do that as well, but want to be respectful of everyone's time. Yeah. Well, I do see a question that can that um, has come in and said, okay, we well, did revenue cycle and clinic with are there other areas that you would do training for that this model could work? Um, so I think the simple answer is yes. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, you know, I will pull this slide up again, Opal, because I know that, you know, it's, it's that, you know, within our firm, within Stratwater, I'm thinking, what do you want to do? Um, as we did with Tamara, it was just, she had an idea, she presented it to us and said, this is what I want to do. I think this would be cool. And we're like, yep, we will help you, you know, we'll design that, we'll look to your needs, but to also come back and say, you know, if there are any areas for your facility that you're thinking, I want additional training on, definitely we can provide that. It's not limited to this. I, I would say that's the joy that I have about working with Stroudwater. It's like you you just ask and we'll find a way to assist you on that and um, give you that, you know, help you out on that. Well, and also, so I, I know that Tamara, this was like kind of like our brainchild of the three of us coming <laughs> up with it together for West Virginia. 
Um, but I will say, based off of even before today, talking about it with some other states, um, I know North Carolina, we did it, we've done it in New York, we've done it in North Carolina, we've done it actually in a couple um, of other states. We've talked to Washington and some others who are, are wanting to design these programs. Um, you know, West Virginia, even historically, we, we did cost report um, and it was actually very much like Eric Shell did a cost report that was very focused on um, non CE, like non CFOs, basically mm -hmm. the cost report for those of us who never want to touch a cost report, right? Like, I mean, I no thank you. But understanding of like, how do you need to understand the cost report for your decision making and understanding how things flow so that as the chief nursing officer, you understand why the CFO is like getting all up in arms about some of these numbers. And so, um, you know, understanding that we also have had one about nurse managers of and also on the ED. So I know one of the other states we had talked to very much had um, one of our colleagues, Carla Wilbur, can you just te like, can we get all of our nurse managers together, med especially around med surge, swing bed, ED, like we know that we have to learn how to like float people and they don't know how to do that. Can you do a training session about floating between departments and do it like a series of like, here's our, the most critical things you need to know for ED, med surge and swing bed and like how I can move back and forth between those. So while this might be our, like the three of us, this was our brainchild, like we can cut, you can come up with anything that people, you know, well, that's the beauty of having a, um, access to experts. But as a state person, you know, recognizing it's whatever the hospital, whatever your hospitals and communities need. And so uh, Tamara, you mentioned the independence RHCs that usually don't have access, they're not eligible for FLIX funds, et cetera. Um, I will say this, this that we put together help become the impetus for NOSOR, which is the national organization of the state offices of rural health. They're putting together for the first time, we were in week three, put together this summer institute specifically for the independent rural health clinics. And it's an eight part series of basically revenue cycle clinic management basics for all the independents across the country through all the different state offices. So I know West Virginia has got like 26, at least 26 independent RHCs, et cetera. There's several that have been participating. Um, I mean, we've got hundreds and hundreds of independent RHCs that um, across the country so that the different states have, but that, that institute came to straight out of this training um, as far as what to do. I would also like to say I'd never actually worked with Stroud Water before I got here a year ago. Uh, but the one thing that I do like that you guys do is you um, when you're doing your programs, they're always personalized, you know, to the, the facility that you're working with, which I think is very helpful. Um, you try to get some background information on them before you ever start. So um, I think that is one of the things that I like the most about your programs as well. And I know that that was very helpful to the rural health clinics as far as, you know, your programming was concerned when you did, when you put our plan together for us. So thank you. Oh, I, th thank you. I just saw that Mary Powell, who is actually attending the Institute, <laughs> pointed out that the Institute's fantastic and, and it's very pr um, pragmatic and focused. So th thank you, Mary, for that. I'm glad that you're, you're finding benefit from it. So. And I would say we received a question about knowing more about any of the uh, the webinars and the trainings that we did. If you are interested, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is there. Um, as I say, I love talking about revenue cycle with people, and <laughs> but then I'll talk about other things too. Uh, just you know, like just being able to do this and working with Tamara. And Tamara, we greatly appreciate your time that you've given us today to share your insights and you know, your experiences within the state of West Virginia. And we're glad that we were um, able to help support you and your state and provide this education to them. So thank you very much. And to everyone else who is sitting on the call, we thank you for your time. I don't know, so, uh, it looks Amy, like they're- I oh, know we're ahead. having a break, but another question has come in that I wanna make oh, sure we yeah, fit in. For that's, this is a question directly for Tamara. It says, do you think that you've been able to get to know your hospitals better during this training? Um, the hospitals, um, no, it, I mean, this is like truly clinic manager driven, the, um, the program that we did, um, we understand how it ties to the hospitals, but there was not a lot of, um, critical access involvement with the, with the clinic piece, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. Um, well, hopefully I will say, I do hope that the, the managers who have been trained, which I have heard from a couple of hospital CEOs that their managers have told, said, thank you for making this available to us. Um, but hopefully, you know, if within these hospitals, if these managers who went through the training on the revenue cycle in the clinic are talking, hopefully it'll encourage other managers throughout the hospital to talk to their C-suites about what kind of things that they would like to have access to. Absolutely. Yep. So. All right. So I think we uh, apologize. We've taken five minutes of your 15 minute break there, but um, it will be coming up. But we have been Ange one more time, Benjamin Anderson, who will be speaking to you. And um, his topic is, um, oh, my goodness, I just why I just I moved that away. What Ben is going to be talking about is um, healing from a moral injury in moral injury in healthcare. So that's what he will be speaking on. Benjamin Anderson is um, just a friend to rural healthcare. He's had experience as a CEO within different facilities and been able to turn them around. So you're hearing from someone who has had the voice of experience of being there and coming and working through the challenges of working at a critical access hospital and understanding what's out there. Um, and just to come back and join us in a bit, and we will leave the webinar open. I believe it's being left open, and you'll see a break slide that's going to come up. And then from that break slide, you will, um, we will be right back. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to speak with you. Any last words, Tamara or Opal? Nothing for me, but thank you so much for the invite. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.
Hi, everyone. Thank you all for waiting patiently. We will be, we will be beginning in just a few moments. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Ben. All right, may we get started? Yes. Thank you all so much for waiting. I, I had a Zoom glitch. I couldn't figure out how to get through Zoom, so I appreciate you all um, having me this morning. I've been asked to talk on uh, essentially the impact and healing moving forward for moral injury and healthcare. And, I'm a storyteller by nature, so if you don't mind, but I'm gonna I'm gonna include some stories as we proceed here. Um, the first one is about uh, a little boy who's eight years old, and his name is Jonathan. Jonathan Paul. We call him John Paul at the house, and uh, I am the father of two ten-year-olds and two eight-year-olds. Um, so for those of you who are paying attention, it is two sets of twins, two boy-girl sets. We went from zero to four kids in 22 months. And so uh, now they are 10, 10, 8, 8, and um, mornings are nuts. So uh, we get everybody up sharply, not a minute before, not a minute after 6.15. We have to be out of the door, uh, out the door at 7.15 for school. And, and one morning, John Paul walked downstairs with no pants on which in a house full of boys and girls, we would generally say is not an ideal uh, move. So we asked him, hey, John, would you please go up, go upstairs and get some pants on? Well, that was around 6.30, around 6.45 comes, I walked back in his room and he's sitting on his bed with no pants on. And uh, he said, dad, I need, and I cut him off. And, and uh, I said, what you need to do is get your pants on, or we say britches, get your britches on. And uh, he just melted in front of me and said, you know, essentially, um, he said, dad, you're making an assumption. And, uh, and so I stopped and smiled a bit and listened to him and said, hey, uh, help me understand what's going on. And he said, well, um, you know, you, you, asked, you asked David, my, his older brother, to clean up the room the day before because you couldn't see the floor in, in the room. Well, David is a, you know, if, if the world is full of either get, get it done quickly or get it done right, folks, David's get it done quickly kind of guy. And he just treated all the laundry like the dirty laundry and, and put all of the clothing in with some really soiled, gnarly clothing. And, and so John didn't have any pants. And what he was trying to tell me is dad, I need some clean pants. And I assumed that I knew what he needed without asking him. And, and in healthcare, uh, assumptions are really dangerous, even deadly. And so um, what he was trying to explain to me is that he didn't have what he needed. I assumed what he needed uh, and, and didn't ask him. I have a friend and mentor by the name of uh, Elizabeth Teisberg who says, 
uh, has taught me that anytime the diagnosis is wrong, the result is waste or harm. We can ensure the accurate, uh, an accurate diagnosis by first asking the right questions. If we skip that step, um, we're, we're in deep trouble in healthcare. I would say that especially applies uh, when, when we talk about the, the condition or well being of the workforce. Um, next story I'll tell you is, is a story I would say the burnout of a doctor. And uh, so you, you all may know this doctor, true story. He, uh, he was born and raised uh, in, in, a, in a rural area. He was identified in, in high school as somebody who was strong in the sciences, bio, biology, chemistry, and uh, teachers encouraged him to, to consider going into medicine. Well, he attended a state school, went through the, uh, the, uh, the pre-med track with the state school and the, and the rural training track and got involved in rural rotations and shadowing doctors. And then he went on to the state med school and he got um, you know, rural focused rotations in med school, uh, committing family medicine, practicing full scope family medicine, got into a, a full spectrum family medicine residency, went on from there in that residency um, to get full scope training in, in inpatient, outpatient ER, trauma, um, on and on and on. Um, he, got, he got all of the training that you would need for a rural physician um, to practice really, to be the only one in the middle of nowhere. Well, then went on from there uh, to even do an international fellowship where he would get training, additional training in burn and trauma and orthopedics. And he did some VP shunts, like to even some minor brain surgeries. Uh, when he was overseas, he got tropical medicine training. He was just really, this was the best physician that America can train. And his plan was to go out to a rural area to practice in a rural area for 30 or 40 years, using some of his time off to do overseas, international or global health work, and, uh, and just, just live out his life, living out his life mission that way. Um, three years into his practice out of his fellowship in a rural area, he was facing leaving medicine, he was toast. He, and, and at his lowest point, he was found in his bathroom passed out on the floor after 12 consecutive days on call. He was exhausted and he was considering leaving medicine altogether. So how does a guy who was born and raised in a rural place, trained his whole life until 30 years old to practice medicine, end up considering leaving medicine only three years later? Here was his reality. He was seeing 30 to 35 patients per day in the clinic. He was on call every third weeknight and every third weekend, primary call. He was charting often until midnight in a dysfunctional electronic medical record. He was turning away 50 patients. Uh, the clinic was turning away 50 patients per week. They just didn't have the coverage to meet the need. And his wife and four kids under six years old were at home without their dad, without their husband. That was his reality. Here's what was going on on the outside with this physician. One, he seemed self-protective, um, grumpy at times. He limited professional access to himself. He was deflecting work to his partners. He became less vigilant about his timely documentation. He, he seemed at times abrasive with the nurses or other team members. He was just grumpy, not, not the, the mission-driven, compassionate guy he came out of residency to be. He became less engaged in the community and ultimately he abruptly left the community considering leaving medicine altogether. That was what was going on on the outside, on the inside of this guy. He felt unseen by the hospital board, the CEO and his clinical partners. He felt like his employer was hanging him out to dry, leaving him vulnerable. He didn't feel protected. He felt overworked that he couldn't provide the care that he'd committed to provide all these years ago for his, for his patients. He was frustrated, felt un, unfair treatment. Uh, from others. And in fact, in his first year out of residency, he was on call twice as much as the next uh, clinician, the next uh, uh, clinician on the most call. So he, he was double the next clinician on, on, on the amount of call he was in. So he felt it was unfair. He felt used like a revenue generating workhorse or patting somebody else's bottom line. He felt isolated in the community in the absence of contact with extended family, no substitutes. And he felt like his marriage was suffering and his kids were without adequate engagement from their dad. Um, he said in this journey, you know, there's a window in our lives where our kids think we're cool. And I think, I think I'm missing it. And at some point, they're not going to think I'm cool anymore. 
and uh, and he wondered if he was missing that. So the clinical definition of burnout that we're going to use for the purpose of this talk today is number one, it's a syn it's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and um, decreased personal uh, or reduced personal accomplishment that can occur among individuals who do people work of some kind. It's a response to the chronic emotional strain of dealing extensively with human beings, particularly when they're troubled or having problems. And a pattern of emotional uh, overload and subsequent emotional exhaustion is at the heart of the burnout syndrome. A person gets overly involved emotionally, overextends from herself, feels overwhelmed by the uh, emotional demands imposed by other people. Can anyone relate to this? over the past three years. This is the definition we're working, we're working from when we think about burnout uh, in the context of healthcare delivery. Um, I was the CEO that wasn't listening to this doctor. And the hard lesson I was learning at the time was exhaustion is the silent thief of empathy that exhaustion actually can siphon empathy from the human soul to the point that a person, including a caregiver, can no longer feel the suffering of other people. And that is dangerous. It's dangerous in healthcare. Clinicians often receive admiration, not empathy, and the two aren't the same. And I would say if you're an administrator on this call, the same is true there except maybe not even the admiration, um, maybe scorn, but definitely not empathy. And so, it, and, 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 and yet empathy is a deep human need that we have. So what was going on underneath the surface with this clinician? Was he non-compliant, a problem child as he was being labeled? Or was there something deeper deeper like, like this deep feeling of moral injury. And we're gonna get into that definition here in a moment. Um, health, healthcare workers within a six month period of time went from hero in Denver, Peyton Manning was delivering meals to, to people at the local hospitals and calling them heroes and people were honking horns and howling at the moon at eight o'clock at night in honor of healthcare workers and that type of thing. We went from that to scorn to doxing, public shaming on social media to physical assaults and sexual assaults in the, in the emergency department. We went from one extreme to the other in a matter of six months and so healthcare workers, in addition to all the stress and strain of dealing with so many sick people were also experiencing that whiplash. I have a mentor friend of mine, her name is Sister Mary Jean Ryan. She's a Catholic nun in St. Louis and she's an amazing human being and, and uh, and she and I have been friends for now 14 years, um, a relentless uh, advocate for the workforce, relentless advocate for the poor. I mean, she was just really focused on quality long before quality was the focus it is now in hospitals. One of the lessons she taught me, and first of all, I want to be just like when I grow up, um, my, minus the Catholic nun part, I'd be a pretty lousy nun. But other than that, I, I want to be just like her. Um, systems heal people, she says, and systems harm or kill people. And it turns out, clinicians, administrators, the workforce, we're people too. And it's so crucial that we think about these things like moral injury and burnout in, in a systemic way. Um, almost everything in the universe functions as a system. I learned that from a guy named Richard Swenson who wrote the book Margin. He was a family physician by training and also had a PhD in mathematics, brilliant guy. And uh, he decided 40 years ago that he was going to buck a trend. He decided that he was going to go 0.75 of an FTE as a doctor for the entirety of his career. And he was going to use the remainder of that time. He would live on less, live simply, but he was really going to live. He was going to enjoy his life. He's going to maintain his relationships, have healthy relationships, have, have, have a healthy marriage. And, uh, and he spent some of his margin over the years researching and writing the book Margin. And uh, I got to know him as I was, I was leading a workshop on moral injury and burnout. I called him for his advice and he said, almost everything in the universe functions as a system. 
the human liver, the Mayo Clinic, or the United Nations, each system has its limits. And when those limits are exceeded, things start breaking down. We can't exceed, we can't deny the limits of the systems without harm to the systems to, to ourselves. In Western culture, we are constantly pressured to do more with less. He went on to tell me, I wish Americans would wake up and realize the fundamental reality of our own limitations. We are not infinite. We are finite. We are not immortal. We are mortal. And we cannot dump on our bodies for decades and our minds and our emotions for decades and expect them to continue to hold up, especially without maintenance. One of the, the, nas the nation's leaders in, in this concept of moral injury and burnout is this is a, is a woman named, she's a psychiatrist from, uh, from Pennsylvania named Wendy Dean. And Wendy uh, wrote a book called If I Betray These Words. Um, and it's about moral injury in healthcare. And she found the, the Institute for Moral Injury in Healthcare. And her definition of moral injury, she said, is a feeling that someone has participated in some way in actions that transgress one's deeply held moral beliefs, or one feels betrayed by, the, by an authority figure preventing them from doing this right. In healthcare, those deeply held beliefs are oaths that we swore to put patients first. There was an epidemic of distress in healthcare for almost two decades before COVID-19, but many physicians didn't feel like the most, the concept of burnout, the most common way to encapsulate that sense of distress was an accurate descriptor of the experience. Moral injury, knowing what patient, a patient needs but being unwilling or un unable, I'm sorry, to provide it because it constrains beyond one's control is acknowledged by most physicians as a more accurate descriptor of their experience, burnout has become kind of a dumping ground. I'm tired, I'm burnt out, I'm overworked, I'm burnt out, I'm feeling sad today, I'm burnt out, I'm grumpy, I must be burnt out. And, and what she is saying now, what people have experienced in healthcare is deeper than the common definition of burnout. We have been put in a situation where we cannot live out our deeply held beliefs because systems are in the way of us doing that. And that is really dangerous, it's really damaging. It turns out, when we think about systems, that breathing exercises actually don't fix call schedules. Who'd have thought? No matter how much we try to use those, breathing exercises don't fix call schedules, mindfulness doesn't correct an unjust work environment, a good night's rest doesn't cure professional isolation, and a vacation doesn't address and or reform an absent, misguided, or outdated, even perverse reward system. You can't solve structural problems with individual solutions. We hand out the breathing exercises and the, the mindfulness exercises because those are the easy things to hand out. But what it tells people in healthcare when we do that is, go fix yourself. You have a balance issue. Never mind the systemic issues, you have a balance issue. Go fix yourself. So what did we do about it at Kearney County Hospital where I was the CEO and this doctor was burning out. First of all, um, Kearney County is located in Kansas. My wife would affectionately call it the rectangular state in the middle or the center of the universe because she was from a farm in rural Kansas, which is what drew us there. We were in the Southwest corner of the rectangular state in the middle and we were serving all the counties in purple and we were in the county in blue. Um, I didn't know this when we moved there, but, but Lake in Kansas as a town was, was nicknamed or named by the Washington Post as the 10th most remote town in the United States, according to the Washington Post. That is not a contest I knew we were in when we moved there. Um, it's certainly not one I wanted to win. Uh, but over, uh, as, as we looked at, at the list of 30 folks over, or in these 30 communities uh, across the country, of the 30 communities in, uh, in the United States, we delivered babies from 10 of them in the year that we saw this list. And we looked at who else was on the list and we realized, gosh, we're up there with Montana around remote and middle of nowhere places. Um, except this, uh, you know, Montana has the beautiful mountains, right? We had the flatlands. And um, I took this picture about six, six miles away from our house um, I just want you to just go through an exercise with me and close your eyes for a moment after you take that picture in and imagine 100 degree weather and just take a deep breath and just picture what that smells like. Um, that is a feedlot. Now picture that there's one on every side of your community 
So no matter what way that famous Kansas wind blows, it smells like that. So that's the summertime. This picture I took walking into one of our clinics in the wintertime. Now, I am not a physicist, um, nor, nor am I a weather guy. I am not of the opinion that icicles should go sideways. They, I've always been in the impression they go up and down. Well, in this community, icicles freeze sideways. That's the winter, that's the summer, that's the winter. This is hard living. The grandchildren who are, the, who are the, the, of the survivors of the Dust Bowl were, were the anchors in these communities. And so what grows in places like that? And I'm not specifically speaking of crops, I'm speaking of people. So what we did when we addressed this was we looked at our community, we looked at our community and we said, what could we learn about growing people from what we already know in our community about growing things in the ground, about growing plants? And so we use the parable of a seedling. If a new healthcare worker, if a physician is like a seedling into what are they being planted? Into what are they being planted? And we, we actually surveyed our group using what's called the community house or the critical access hospital community APGAR model out of University of North Dakota with Dave Schmitz. He designed this thing. It's a 10 year old, 12 year old validated tool um, that has 50 criteria that, we, that, that look at five classes, geography, economics, scope of practice, medical support, hospital community support. We actually figured out, you know, what, what is it like to live and work here by asking the people who were there um, using this validated model, but we took it further and we, and we said, well, what if we actually bucketed that information into what the United States Department of Agriculture calls the principles of soil health? So what if we, what if we actually looked at it like that? So maximize living roots is taking care of your existing people. Minimizing disturbance, that's addressing the stuff that's driving folks off, the, the dysfunction. Maximize biodiversity, remove bio and look at the organization's holistic view of diversity, not only race, but, but age and, and socioeconomic background and experiences and, and uh, on and on. But look, looking at holistically diversity, does your leadership team match the community you're living in? Do, you know, does the staff, uh, you know, is it, is it an emotionally safe environment? And then finally, maximizing soil cover. And that's essentially the innovation in between harvests. What are we doing to keep something on the ground so what we have doesn't blow away? That's the innovation in between harvest. So, so what are we doing there? But we actually did some research around that, figured, figured out some best practices around living roots that we were able to look at implementing or one, intentional mentorship, asking uh, team members for insight, prioritizing culture and connection, providing opportunities to grow, elevating your purpose, incentivizing loyalty within an organization and embracing flexibility. These are ways of, of maximizing living roots or keeping the folks in your, in your current system already engaged. Under minimize disturbance, avoidance of disorganization, ongoing commitment to team, clear and consistent communication, system of accountability, holding folks accountable. Um, folks really generally want to be held accountable and certainly wanna work it within systems that wanna be held, right, where people are held accountable. Empowerment of people, clearly defined goals, and then realistic expectations that go along with those goals around the accomplishment of those goals. That's, those are tools, well-documented, well-researched uh, tools for minimizing disturbance. Under maximizing diversity, again, your leadership matches your community. You're pursuing diversity holistically, which includes, but doesn't, is not limited to race. Diversity in all, uh, in lived experiences, dividing data by people group. Is this an organization that can take first its workforce data, but then its outcome data, divide it by people group and look at the numbers and do something about the differences in those numbers. Um, promoting from within um, a culture that invites uh, disagreement and different, different perspectives and diversity at all levels of the organization from governance all the way to the front line. Those are some tools around maximizing diversity. And then lastly, maximizing soil cover. So um, best practices around that, forming innovation teams. Like we call them MacGyver teams. Like so we got a MacGyver team together where it, these are folks that can just hack unsolved problems. Um, empower people to innovate, accommodate multiple learning styles, deploy concise mental models so, so everybody really can agree on the model for solving problems. 
um, and, 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 and standardize those and work together on them. Foster teamwork, reward curiosity, offer real-time feedback. These are ways of, of, of creating an innovative culture of solutions-based thinking. So we had to look at what kind of soil in our community were we working with? What were we working with? Was this rocky, sandy, yucky stuff where, where things you know, wouldn't do so well? Or was this topsoil, was, which was just rich, like straight out of a nursing facility, right? Um, or was it somewhere in between? But we can often analyze the soil where people grow by looking at the condition of what's growing there. And what we had was wilting. It was, it was burning out. And so if we took a realistic look at ourselves, the issue wasn't a shortage of doctors in the United States. What we came to the conclusion of is there, there are more mission-driven, highly qualified primary care physicians willing to practice in a mission-driven, safe community. Safe meaning emotionally safe, addressing the issues that are driving moral injury, that kind of thing. There are more physicians willing to practice in an area like that than there are safe locations for them to practice. And we had to become a safe location for them to practice and to work. And we had to first start by looking at our own yucky soil and recognizing we think it's us. So then as we looked at that, we looked at the common motiv motivators or provider profiles for, uh, for practicing. Who would wanna practice in a place where it's surrounded by feedlots in the middle of nowhere um, where the icicle, icicles freeze sideways? Well. We found six, and in 15 years of recruiting, I haven't really found a seventh category consistently. Um, and they are one, the local kid coming home. Merry Christmas if we find that one. The foreigner, and I say this understanding that it comes off and is often condescending, but it's often how people are treated. The J1H1B work visa physician comes into a community that's the only one that speaks Arabic uh, or Tagalog or Tigrinya or, or uh, another language fluently in that community. Um, and they generally stay for three to four years until they can get that coveted green card and move on. There's the troublemaker. This one cuts up goats in the front yard or drinks a mysterious red potion and, and uh, slurs his words at work or has an inappropriate in and out relationship with high school kids at his house or um, throws instruments at nurses or yells the F-bomb at inappropriate times or, or whatever the thing is. He might even show up with a significant other that he met on the road on the way to his interview um, at some gentleman's club. I mean, all of these things, you think these are outlandish examples. Get on the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts uh, website, you will find some doozy stories uh, under, under uh, the, the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts website. These were all actually true stories that happened in West Kansas, those examples. So I spent more time on the troublemaker, there are plenty of those uh, that, that are reliant on a place that is beheld to their license because they can't recruit anybody else. There's the coaster. Um, this one's done, done working, but not done getting paid. Um, maybe had a couple of family situations happen or a bad business deal or something came up where he needs to keep working, but really he's just pretty tuckered out. And so he's willing to go work outpatient only for somewhere for a little while while somebody else pays for all the call. We'll have the locums do the work like that, but I'll, I'll come and provide a steady presence for a few years until his, re, his, his or her retirement is, is set up and then they're done, not a long-term strategy. There's the money doctor. If you pay me more than a half a million dollars to practice family medicine, I'll go anywhere until somebody pays me just a little bit more than that. Um, and then I'm out or until I've saved up enough of a nest egg that I can move to Boulder or wherever I wanna move. Um, pay off all my loans and then I'm gone. And then the last one is the missionary, the one that's driven by a sense of mission or purpose that's greater than themselves and the, and the greater the need, the more they're drawn there, often but not always by their faith, but always by a sense of justice, a uh, sense of responsibility, a, a strong social conscience. And we figured out that the millennial generation is full of them and that's the one we want. And if we could make that one, find that one with some local ties, then it would be like a best case scenario because they come in with the, the support systems that are needed. Then I got with a faculty member at Via Christie's Family Medicine Residency in Wichita, who was actually from our little county. And I asked him for advice on what we should be looking for. And he said, analyze their motivations, become students of people's motivation and ensure that it's in line with the organization's motivation or mission. Look at training, the type of training and volume, look at that. Look at their experience, 
um, not just their their years of experience, but their 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 service. So make sure they're trained properly for what you're going to have having them do, and then how are they choosing to use their their experience? And then the three non-negotiables he described were compassion, work ethic, and teachability. Teachability implying humility, implying humility. We want to make sure you don't, he said, you don't have energy to be teaching people in their thirties, how to be compassionate, how to be humble, how to work hard. Those things need to come built in. That was their mom and daddy's job. All right. Then he said, when you're interviewing them, ask, give them what we would call the heebie-jeebie test. Would I want my loved one to be in a a room alone with this person? Or do they give me the heebie-jeebies? If they give you the heebie-jeebies, don't work with them. Don't choose to work with them. It's not a good idea because ultimately they're going to cause problems that are going to leave anyway. Instead of trying to compete with affluent areas using money, country clubs, shopping, prestige, focus on opportunities to eradicate suffering of vulnerable people, focus on opportunities to pursue justice. Those can become some of your greatest recruitment assets as we address the environment, what it's like to work there. And so our message became to the people to replace this doctor, if your desires are to develop meaningful human relationships, relieve suffering, pursue justice, we are as competitive a location is anywhere in the United States. It changed the narrative. We were no longer saying we have this one house with a brick on the front that kind of looks like you're in the suburbs. We're not in the suburbs. We have a nine hole golf course. If you play it twice, it's 18 holes. We're not a golf course community. If you want to play golf, there's a place to play golf. If you want to find a house, we'll, we'll try our best to find you the right livable house. But don't expect the suburbs when you come here. It turned our recruiting approach upside down And we were able to reform the culture within the organization over a period of time, clearly focused on mission and vision of values. So once we established organizational readiness, we then analyzed community readiness. Support systems, one of our doctors said in a rural community can take years to cultivate. The scrutiny begins immediately. The scrutiny begins immediately. Oh, you bought that house? You're heading into the liquor store. What are you getting? You're driving that car now? We must be paying you quite a bit. Look how you disciplined your kid. Those things begin immediately in a rural community, but it takes a long time for the support systems to develop. And what they were deeply desiring more than anything else was community developed through hospitality, deep, meaningful, family-like, authentic relationships with other human beings. That's what they were after more than anything else. And they were willing to live at the end of the earth with assurance that they would get that. And so we had to also just acknowledge as we were designing this model that, and I'm just gonna pick on the world's largest social media platform, this isn't friendship and that isn't love. They are woefully dishonest and inadequate substitutes for the two. And we can't assume that because somebody has a thousand new friends in your town as a clinician, that they have a thousand friends, that they in fact have anyone that would have them over Um, So this is how we viewed our hospitality going into this process toward newcomers in our town. Oh, we're a nice town. We welcome people. We're friendly. We're kind. You know, show up to some ball games and people will let you in. This is how newcomers were experiencing our hospitality as they moved into our town. Maybe different than we thought. And then the realization that lifting two fingers off the steering wheel as we drive by somebody isn't actually hospitality. It's not actually hospitality. It's not having somebody over and breaking bread with them. It's not watching their kids for them. It's not doing a grocery run for them to save them the trip. It's not hospitality. It's lifting two fingers off the top of the steering wheel, which can actually feel like the middle finger to a new person who's there and isolated is to say, I see you. I don't care. And this is how we were being perceived. Whether we liked it or not, this is how we're being perceived. So we began answering their primary question, who will be my family here? And I just want to stop and say, I shamelessly ripped this picture off of Pinterest. I don't have dishes that look like this. I don't have linens that look like that. We, um, hospitality doesn't have to look like this. Hospitality can look like this. This is my house. 
that's my house. My wife gave them, our two kids, toddlers at the time, a bowl of, of cooked noodles and it entertained them for over an hour. And one of our guests took this picture. That's our place. When they came over, they found this. It can look like this. So we redefined family among our team. We started saying, hey, we're having folks over. What can you bring? Can you bring something that'll lighten the, the load for preparing something? Um, if you're not bringing food, can you help get the house ready over here? Can you help pick it up after it's done so that the host among us ended up with a cleaner house than they started with? And they really were just responsible for opening up the space, welcoming people, um, offer, offering them hospitality and saying, you know, you're welcome here. Um, and, then, and then sending them home with a heart that was full. The picture on the right is actually of our neighbor. They had a one-year-old or one and a half-year-old at the time was just starting to get around and walk. We're, we're fairly sure <clears throat> that she is pooping outside the chicken house right there. That is life. Parts of life don't smell very good. And we just started saying, we don't have to have a perfect house. We don't have to have a perfect setting. We don't have to have the perfect food. We're not entertaining. We're having folks over, what can you bring? And so we started asking, what would we do for our own family? If our own family was moving here, what would we do? Well, this is, a, this is the Olson family who was among the physicians that we recruited into the community after the physician that I mentioned moved on. Um, and we thought, well, they're gonna need a house. They got three young kids, they're gonna need a house. And so we found this house that looks pretty nice on the outside. It was, I think it was $159,000 and it didn't even end up on Zillow because we found it because we knew somebody that was willing to sell it and didn't wanna have to mess with putting it on Zillow. And so we said, well, I mean, it was very outdated on the inside. It was probably hadn't been updated in 20 or 30 years. So it needed some work on the inside. Um, but we ended up saying, well, why don't you come out and look at this house? And then if you buy it, we'll lease it back from you for the cost of buying it. We'll put med students in it until you get out of residency. And in the meantime, instead of giving you a, a signing bonus, we'll give you a housing bonus, but you have to use that money to buy and renovate a home. So they use their housing bonus to do the renovations and our maintenance team from the hospital didn't do the renovations work, but they helped manage it. They were managing the company because they knew all the good contractors in town. We did what I would do for my brother. I would want my brother to have the best house that he could possibly have in town. I'd be scouring the whole town to find, figure it out. I'd be helping him with contractors to get there. All those things, we did that for them. And so they were able to move in and instead of spending their first six months in a war zone, in a construction zone at their house, they spent their first six months building relationships in the community and inviting people into their home that was recently renovated. And no matter what happens, if they ever left and they're still in the town, they're still in the community, they actually bought a, bought a larger house uh, out on the edge of town. That, ta that house became a better house for our community and improved our housing stock. That doctor then a year or two later, actually a year later after he was out of residency and had been in practice for a year, came to me and said, hey, I have an idea. And I think, because uh, he'd had three MAs, he'd had three medical assistants in his first year. Um, and I figured he was just gonna blitz me about how he can't keep an MA. This guy highly values his time. He values other people's time. He couldn't get his traction for, for clinic flow. And so he sits down and says, you know, I figured out that the last three medical assistants, they left um, for $4 an hour more. And they can't afford the very services that we're providing in our clinic. So they left for four bucks an hour more. And, um, and I know we don't have a lot of money, but I did visit with the CFO and I said, what, what would it cost if we gave them all a $4 an hour raise plus benefits? She gave me a number. And then I said, well, what would it cost if they all got an, a medical assistant certification so we can improve the quality of our medical assistants? And I got a number. And then I looked at our own contracts and figured out that we get $45 an hour for ER call pay, even in addition to all the collections or RVU stuff that we get. It's already being paid to be in there from a volume standpoint. And we get call pay on top of that. If we reduce that down to 40 of us for all the hours we're on call with all seven partners, uh, all these physician partners, um, we could actually we could actually more than pay for the entire cost of the, the MA uh, 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 wage increases. If we're willing to, to reduce this, and I visited with all seven of our partners, we're all willing to sign an addendum to our contract. Could we use that money to pay the MAs more? I could have. I could have hugged and kissed this guy. 
In 90 days, we had that implemented. He identified a problem. He identified the solution. He, he used solutions-based thinking to come up with it. He got stakeholders involved and, and MA turnover flattened and has been flat since. He solved it. It's a very different conversation if I as the CEO go, how'd you like to take a pay cut? So we can pick the, pay the MAs more. He did it. And the reality for them was that their compensation increased the following year because their clinic was efficient and they were compensated based on volume and their collections. And it went up. He didn't do it for more money. He did it because he wanted to help us solve a problem, but he did it for a system that took care of his family, that found him a home, that helped renovate that house. He was loyal to that system and he wanted to see it be better. This is what the workforce looked like after three years, after we turned over the soil, after we addressed the structural issues that were driving moral injury within our community, all the ones surrounded in blue, in the blue boxes, those are all millennials and they're all new physicians that we recruited into the community. We even took it further because there were so many doctors wanting to work at our little hospital in the middle of nowhere that we, that we started helping our, our hospitals around us recruit the same way. And uh, so there were so many doctors calling us, we we're gonna have to start turning them away. So we started calling our hospitals around saying, hey, can we hand you our playbook? Would you like to do something similar? Would you be willing to recruit in groups? And so we got family medicine residents that were calling, asking to work there. I said, why don't half your class come out here and hang out with us? Come on out. And we convinced rich people to give us their, their airplanes to fly these people in in bulk. And they all flew in on the same week and the governor flew out and welcomed them. He was a doctor at the time. And they showed up at the Garden City Zoo, which if you're expecting the San Diego Zoo, you're gonna be disappointed. But if you're expecting like a park with some trees and a few animals, you'll be blown away by how cool the zoo was. So we took them all to the zoo. We gave them a tour of the area packing plant uh, because the world's largest packing plant was nearby and a lot of their patients would come from there. They wanted to see inside of there, exposed them to some of the cultures that were in the area. And, and we just showed them what it was like living out there, living and working out there. And when we did this, we did that three years in a row, hosted these focus weekends. This is what West Kansas looked like. Remember that square in the bottom left-hand corner of the rectangular state in the middle, right? This is what it looked like. That represents primary care access for 40,000 West Kansans. That's wild. That is game changing. When we address the structural issues that are driving moral injury, here were some of the practical outcomes. We went from turning away 50 patients per week to 60% growth in our primary care visits over three years. We went from our, our 180 deliveries over double that in the three years later, our, our volumes increased significantly as people were driving up to two hours to deliver care, even bypassing other places in larger towns. We went um, from physicians being on call every third night, every third weekend to every fifth night, every eighth weekend back in call, backup call because we recruited APPs in with this group as well. We went physicians regularly com uh, completing documentation late into the evenings to being done closer to 6 p.m. because we reformed some of the electronic medical record stuff that was driving them crazy. And then we went from a net profit margin of negative 3% to 3%. It doesn't sound like a lot. That's a 6% gain. That's a red number to a black number. And it worked. This was the tool we used. I'm handing it to you. What outcome needs improvement? Start with something simple. Start with the easy. Work toward the hard stuff later, but start with the easy. Who are the stakeholders? Start with the willing. Develop a comprehensive list of stakeholders. Start with the willing ones. Let them convince the unwilling ones for you. Start with something easy and work with the willing. Where can each stakeholder contribute? Again, we could be talking about moving the coffee maker 100 feet. Nurses or, nurses or doctors are having to walk 100 feet too many to get their nectar. What do we do to fix that? Well, we're the stakeholders. What can each contribute? Maybe it's a second coffee maker. Maybe we can move it, right? Why isn't it already happening? Looking at the barriers to success is really crucial. How would we measure success? If we don't measure it, it doesn't matter. No commitment to measurements, no commitment at all. And when do we expect to see progress? Putting a timeline on it and then getting after it and building momentum around one outcome at a time, one thing at a time, fixing one thing at a time. How is your organization assessing the environment in which you're recruiting and retaining healthcare workers? Is it addressing moral injury? How do you know when people are growing and bearing fruit? How do you know when they're withering? What are ways you are measuring? We use Community Aptar. 
We use the soil test. How, how are you doing that? What are the elements of healthy soil in your local context? And who would you engage to test the soil? What would you do with that information? Just wanna ask you as we, as we think about this, if you knew there was something that could be done, a structural change that could happen that was possible, that could change the conversation around moral injury in your own context, but it was gonna be really hard to do, would you do it anyway? Would you do it anyway, even though it was gonna be hard? We can't change the weather. The weather is what it is, but there's a lot we can do in the midst of it. We've got to invite people to the conversation to contribute. And the people with the solutions are often the people who are closest to the problems. It's the doctor who'd seen three MAs come and go, who asked the MAs who were even closer to the problem, What's the deal? What's going on? What would keep you here? What would give you fulfillment in the workplace? This is the doctor I told the story about at the beginning of this presentation. He is now practicing, still in medicine, in the Middle East, in a very mission-driven context where women have significant access to healthcare problems, significant barriers to, 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 to healthcare in his local context. He is doing fulfilling work and he and I remain really good friends. We actually co-wrote, he didn't co-wrote, but three, three, uh, two friends of mine and I wrote his story in, in a Harvard Med School teaching case called Rural Healthcare Leadership Conundrum, the Burnout of a Good Doctor. He offered his time to be part of writing that story. He and his partner from medical school wrote this, uh, or, I mean, or contributed to this story and when they did that, um, the first time we taught it, we were teaching it via Zoom, and John Berkey logged in from Lake in Kansas because he was back from overseas covering for his friend doing locum's work. There had been enough healing in that story that he was able to come back and serve his friend in the community in that way. And I'll wrap it up with this. John Paul, what he was doing, what he was communicating to me in his eight-year-old way, was he's saying, I don't have what I need. And I think my challenge to you as leaders, as you consider this is, do you have what you need to be healthy? I remember a staff member, vividly remember a staff member suddenly dying. Uh, in a car wreck. Certain details around it were tragic. And anyway, she was a beloved medical assistant in our clinic. People loved her. Family was in town. I knew exactly what to do. I need to call in bereavement services, cancel clinic, um, get them counseling, um, give them uh, brain space, days off, call in a prayer vigil, organize it all. I knew what to say and to whom I needed to say it. I felt nothing. I felt nothing. And I realized that something in me was broken. I had been pushing myself for so long that I couldn't even bring myself to feel the suffering of this family. And if that is you, there is hope, there is redemption. On the back end, John was advocating for himself. He was saying, I need, I can't, I, I, I can't do it if I don't have what I need. We can't give what we don't have. We can't draw from a well that's empty. So it is so important that we look at the structures in our lives, the, expect, the professional and personal expectations that are driving our own health outcomes and our own well-being, and ensure that those structural changes happen so that we can continue to pour into others. Leaders are, are constantly pouring into their teams and, and, and overlooking their own needs. So my challenge to you is start at home, start with you. Thank you so much. I think at this point, Hillary, we turn it back over to you. Is that right? Or 
So um, thank you very much, Benjamin. That was awesome. Um, and we do have um, some comments in the Q and A. Um, I don't know if you're able to see them, but um, we we have some positive feedback in there, um, saying that from a physician you've hit the nail on the head, um, and just thanking you for for the presentation and asking for copies of your slides, which everyone will receive. Um, so uh, no specific questions, it looks like, but um, but some positive feedback. Um, I'd, I'd love to know from the group. I know it's a big group and it can be challenging or intimidating to even comment in the chat. Um, if you were to take away one thing from the last hour, what would it be? Do you want what? me to try and uh, see if I can unmute people? Sure. Ben? Either that or they can type it into the chat, either one, but I'm wondering what it would be because what you take away might be somebody else's aha moment as they leave. So Ben, this is Opal. Um, one thing that I took away is the success story of stop making excuses for being rural with regards to recruitment. I think one thing that I have seen from a provider recruitment standpoint and that um, always gives me heart palpitations is I hear a CEO start the interview with, um, with it, apologies, right? It's, it's right off the bat them saying, you know, we know we don't have this, we know we don't have a robot, we know we don't have state of, you know, et cetera, um, as opposed to, you know, I think the story you told about here's who we are, here's who we're going to be for you, and what you're looking for in that, um, and, but the number of C, um, interviews that start out with, I'm um, so, you know, I know we're not X, Y, and Z. Yeah, own who you're not going to be, That that's completely okay, but starting the conversation with who you are and making no apologies for who you are. Um, there's, it's beautiful to be from rural. Like, I mean, I'm from a small town in Idaho. Like, and I, you know, I, one of my best friends from high school is now a provider there. And so, and she, her, her husband, she dragged him kicking and screaming <laughs> in Pocatello, Idaho, about he, that he was going to be a general surgeon in southeastern Idaho when he was from a large city. And they have built their family there. There's, you know, we don't need to make apologies for being rural. Be who we are serve the communities that we serve and and recognizing and what we're looking for is such a big thing of finding people who will um, celebrate that with us and really be part of our rural family. That's wonderful, Opal, thank you. Opal gave everyone else the privilege of going second. Anybody else? We have um, someone in the, um, in the Q and A who commented that flipping recruitment on its head and stopping comparison was their takeaway. Cool. Lori, can you take, it looks like Mary Powell has her hand raised. Can you take Mary off of mute? I, I believe I did. I've given Mary permission to talk. So I'm asking Mary to unmute. I think she might have to unmute on her own, but she does have permission. Um, I'm gonna go. All right. Well, I know, um, Mary, if you'll put your comment in the chat since we're having issues with the mute. And I did see a comment from Sean saying that we will, yes, everybody will get the recording, not just the slide deck because Ben's message, making sure you get it. Um, well, the pictures are lovely, Ben. It's not the same without your story. So we thank everybody for joining us on day two. Um, I know we're at the end of the conference and um, today. So. Thank you for joining us for our third annual conference, um, virtual uh, critical access hospital conference, and please um, fill out the survey. Thanks for the opportunity, everyone. It's been a pl pleasure and privilege to be with you. Thank you, everyone. And yes, please um, share your feedback with us. If you have time, we would um, welcome any opportunity to improve these presentations. Thank you, everyone.